Thank you, Andy, and thank you to the organizers of the conference. Uh, I think my title might be able to have been used by any of the speakers at this whole symposium. <clears throat> I wanted to pick something that I could fit into. Uh, but a little bit more specifically, I would like to talk about how we approach estimating health impacts of radiation releases from nuclear facilities. And there are two general approaches which you've already heard about. I want to identify them and their logical bases and compare them. Uh, one approach is risk assessment. And that means that we use some estimates of dose and we multiply the estimates of dose to people by some dose response curve which gives us the estimated number of effects, number of events or cases of disease for each amount of dose. And the other method is epidemiology which means that there's some kind of surveillance for disease and we look at the differences in the rates of disease between exposed and unexposed populations. So I want to begin with um, talking about uh, risk estimation or projection. And this may be obvious, but I think it's worth noting or repeating something that, uh, that we all know is that randomized human experiments looking at the long-term consequences of exposure to various forms of ionizing radiation are not possible. So we, we can't conduct experiments. We can't conduct human experiments. So we have to either extrapolate from cellular or animal studies or conduct non-randomized human studies, which are uh, the epidemiologic studies. And both of these approaches suffer from problems of bias and uh, selection, measurement error and selection, which of course experiments also suffer from biases, but uh, I won't go into that today. So uh, just recently this document came out from the World Health Organization. It's already been referred to most recently by Ian Fairley. And it is a risk assessment or risk estimation and it is based on the dose estimates produced in a previous report from last year on Fukushima. And it's also based on uh, data from the lifespan study of A-bomb survivors, which you've heard about and you will hear about more in just a moment. Um, this dose assessment, I, I want to emphasize just a few of the things that Ian Fairley already has said, that there are an, a number of components of the dose that are ignored. The committee chose not to assess doses within 20 kilometers of Fukushima, of the, of the nuclear plant. Uh, they chose not to assess the radioactive gases such as xenon and they did not assess fetal doses. Um, and I, th I think uh, Dr. Wardalecki has already given us a great introduction to why we might care very much about the fetal doses. Um, but what I want to start out with is talking about the lifespan study. And I'm going to show you a little bit of information that has been around for a long time from a volume that came out in the 1970s, as well as some very recent information that has just appeared within the last 90 days from Radiation Effects Research Foundation and from our group at the University of North Carolina. Um, this, these graphs show the immediate casualties uh, at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in relation to distance from the hypocenters of the atomic explosions. And I want to make the point uh, that 
the study upon which all our risk estimates are based did not begin until more than five years after the bombings. And many people did not survive to be in the study. If mortality from the immediate effects of the bombings is related at all to frailty and to longer-term risk, there would have been a harvesting of the most sensitive, radiosensitive people from this population. I think that's a very important thing to remember, uh, especially because of the destruction of the physical infrastructure of these cities, uh, food supplies, water supplies, hospitals. Um, Hiroshima was hit by a typhoon. So there, there are lots of forces that are selecting, that we're selecting for healthier people. Uh, I also would note that the study of cancer incidents, which you've already heard about at this symposium, did not begin until 1958. So any estimates of cancers following exposure to radiation based on the lifespan study, cancer incidents, omit all cancers that occur within 13 years of exposure. And we know from many other studies that lots of cancers occur in less time than that. And this is something that is routinely omitted when risk estimates from the lifespan study are applied to other populations, including the population of Fukushima and the population of Japan. Um, it, and especially important in the shorter term effects are the impacts of in utero exposure uh, and also shorter, shorter latency cancers such as leukemia and lung cancer. Now uh, a few other, um, a little bit more information from the 1970s volume on physical, medical, and social effects of the bombing. This is a depiction of the radiation from the atomic bombing of Nagasaki. Uh, we have the epicenter or hypocenter and the gamma neutron radiations coming from the blast, which were, were over. Those radiations were gone within seconds. But there are other sources of radiation, as depicted by the arrows coming from the ground below the blast, the gamma and beta induced radiation from neutron activation. And then uh, here in the Nishiyama district, in particular, radioactive fallout. Now, the Radiation Effects Research Foundation, which was responsible for the A-bomb studies, has chosen not to estimate any of the radiation doses due to these two um, other sources, residual radiation being composed of either induced radiation or uh, fallout. Uh, fallout was also a problem in Hiroshima. Uh, you can see in this map the drawings of where uh, the fallout, so-called black rain, uh, came in Hiroshima. And note that in both of these uh, depictions, the fallout is not right at the, primarily right at the hypocenter. Who's more affected here? People who live at some distance. So this is very important in an epidemiologic study because it means that um, the fallout is disproportionately affecting people with the lowest doses directly from the gamma and neutron of the blasts. What happened after the blasts? Who was near the ground zero? Oh, first let me finish with the, um, the fallout and the black rain. Uh, so this report just came out in December from the Radiation Effects Research Foundation. And they asked people about exposure to black rain. They asked the survivors. 
and uh, of the 86,671 survivors in the primary analyses that give us our risk estimates, um, 12,000 approximately said yes, but over 21,000, there's no information. And this is something I want to um, emphasize, is that the lack of data, missing data, is a big problem in the lifespan study that could be investigated more, but has been ignored for a half century. Um, RERF has also reported this December on the mortality rates between 1950 and 2003 on the left, and between 1962 and 2003 on the right uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the excess relative risk, which uh, zero is, indicates the referent group that's not exposed to fallout, um, that the group reporting exposure to black rain in both cities has no difference in mortality over either time period. But the unknown group in both cities has an excess mortality. It's 27% in Hiroshima and 46% in Nagasaki. And if you look at the difference between 1950 to 2003, those estimates I just cited, there's basically no difference in the period 1962 to 2003. This means that during, during the period 1950 and 1962, there was a very large excess mortality among people who provided no information on their exposure to black rain. And that's a very important time period that I'll come back to in a minute. Now let's talk about the early entrants, the people who could have been exposed to induced radiation uh, at, near the hypocenter. Um, here are some dose estimates for days two and three for people who would have spent 12 hours from RERF. Uh, we don't have any estimates from them for day one, but we know that induced radiation fell off very rapidly. Um, these are photographs from Yosuke Yamahata taken the day after the bombing of Nagasaki. And what I want you to notice is that people are there. And these are not the people who were exposed at the hypercenter. These are people who are coming in from other areas. They're going through the city. Some of them are looking for their relatives. When I was in Nagasaki, I had the opportunity to tour the museum there with a survivor who knew the woman on the left, on the right side of this photograph and uh, explained to me that she was still living, this was just about five years ago, and that this photograph, she found her, mo her mother. But people were there, and they were not the people who were most exposed to the blast. They were tended to be people from further away. So that's a differential exposure again to a type of radiation that is not counted in the lifespan study. Now the next few slides I want to share are from our group at University of North Carolina. Uh, what they show for Hiroshima and Nagasaki are the uh, distances from hypocenter of three groups of people. The proximal survivors in the first panel, the distal survivors in the second panel, and the survivors with missing dose in the third panel. And you can see that only proximal survivors could have missing dose. That's because the uh, RERF did not require detailed interviews with distal survivors to produce a dose estimate. They were all assigned to the lowest dose category. This forces a relationship between missing dose and exposure. You can only have a missing dose if you're exposed. Now, um, here's the same situation occurs in Nagasaki. Now, what does that mean in terms of the lifespan study? Um, this table shows us that in the 1950s, there were 
higher rates of mortality among survivors with unknown doses from all causes, from all cancers, and from leukemia. So here we're taking out of the high dose group people with high mortality rates. What does that do to the dose response estimate? If we remove the high mortality individuals from the groups with the higher doses. I think it's obvious. Oh, I must mention one other thing about this period between 1950 and the early 1960s. In 1950, all, all survivors were entered into follow-up on October 1st, 1950. However, all survivors had not completed sufficient interviews to be assigned a dose at that time. The interviews needed to assign a dose continued until 1965. Yet RERF, in all their analyses, to estimate these risk coefficients that are applied to populations around the world, have entered people and on October 1st, 1950, who could not be in the study until later. It's a phenomenon that epidemiologists call immortal person time. What this does is it inflates the denominator of the rates, of the, the cancer rates, for the proximal survivors. So this is another phenomenon that causes an underestimate of the cancer rates for the proximal survivors. So we have another source of bias. This is, uh, I'm not aware that this has been written about, but you can find it in our recent paper in American Journal of Epidemiology. There are a couple of other things to say about the lifespan study. We don't have information about the carcinogenic effect, effects of in utero exposures, which are clearly very important uh, the embryo and fetus are clearly very sensitive to the carcinogenic effects of radiation, probably much more so than, than children. But the, the lifespan study doesn't give us information on that at all. And therefore, that uh, effect is left out of many of the dose estimates that, are, that we typically see. So I want to talk quickly about now four epidemiologic studies. Uh, where my message here is what is projected based on the lifespan study of ABOM survivors and what has been seen in the epidemiologic studies. Uh, this is a graph from David Brenner who spoke yesterday uh, estimating the number of people who would be needed, need to be followed for life to detect an increase in cancer mortality based on the lifespan study estimates. And you can see that at low doses, under uh, 50 milligray or so, uh, we're talking about hundreds of thousands to millions of people, according to these estimates. So I learned about this first. I started working on radiation in 1998 when I was um, assigned to lead a study of the mortality of workers from Oak Ridge National Laboratory whose radiation doses had been monitored from very early on with individual badges. You can see here workers putting their, um, their radiation meters in the proper boxes. And I was told we would not find any effect of radiation in this population because it was too small and the doses were too low. So my first um, encounter with the dominant wisdom in this field was when we found that only after about 20 years latency we were seeing dose response relationships. The higher the readings on the badges, the higher the cancer rates of the workers. But this was impossible, I was told. Um, Chernobyl, you've heard a great deal about. I want to call your attention to this passage from a 1991 document, uh, five years after Chernobyl. 
uh, from the IAEA, Atomic Energy Agency, on the basis of the doses estimated by the project teams and currently accepted radiation risk estimates, future increases over the natural incidence of cancers or hereditary effects would be difficult to discern even with large and well-designed long-term epidemiologic studies. And you've seen a plethora of information uh, today and yesterday that this turned out not to be so. Um, just as one graph, I, I won't dwell on it, uh, from a thyroid cancer study which had individual dose estimates including um, information from uh, scans, thyroid scans. Uh, another uh, nuclear event uh, where we were told there could possibly, no, that there were no cancer effects possible was the Three Mile Island nuclear accident in 1979. Um, I have just a few photos here from Bob Del Tredici, his book, The People of Three Mile Island, to give you a sense of uh, what the area was like in 1979. People lived quite close to the plant. Um, many reported uh, symptoms of, such as uh, reddening of the skin, deaths of pets and animals, nausea and vomiting, hair loss, um, and they were told that uh, this was due to stress. Now, um, I started working on this because of a lawsuit that involved several thousand people, and I first did look into stress. I think it's, stress is very important, and I'm sure the people of Three Mile Island were under a tremendous amount of stress. However, my assessment of the medical literature was that their reports did not fit the scenario of stress-induced acute effects, um, sometimes called mass hysteria in the medical literature. So uh, we conducted a reanalysis of data on cancer incidents that were collected from local hospitals uh, during, during the period 1975 to 85, and um, dose estimates made by the investigators, and we found um, and, and I want to m point out one thing that this study was designed to avoid a, a problem that's a big concern in any well-publicized event, which is that there's detection bias. People report sooner, they get more diagnostic tests, so we expect there to be an effect of detection bias on the disease incidence rate following an event like this. Everyone in this study was within 10 miles. They were all ex exposed to the same detection bias. This is a, a graph showing our results. The radiation doses in the area are shown from very low in the green to uh, high in the deep red. And the bars indicate the uh, relative rates of lung cancer that occurred between two and seven years after the event. And what's very clear is that the lung cancer incidence rates uh, rose dramatically in the direction of the plumes, where the plumes from the uh, emissions were estimated to have traveled in the first days of the accident. And again, the risk projections s said there would be no effects. Um, next, I want to uh, mention studies of uh, routinely operating nuclear power plants, which is a topic of current interest in the uh, National Academy of Sciences. Tim Musa, who spoke yesterday, has been on their panel. Uh, they, this is also a situation where the projection is that no cancers will be observed following or among people who are exposed to routinely operating reactors. Um, and so, a study like European studies has never been done in the U.S. I brought one example of a study of childhood leukemia in, in Germany. These are the study areas around their 16 nuclear plants. And this table shows that uh, in the 0 to 5 age group, uh, the uh, rate ratio, relative risk, or odds ratio, all equivalent here, 
in the five, the zero to five kilometer zone, it's a, more than a doubling of childhood leukemia incidents in this, these areas collectively compared to the areas of further away. And, and in each case, the comparison group is not from some other place. It's, they're also uh, in the same areas, cases and controls in this study. So the authors conclude radiation exposure near German nuclear power plants is a factor of 1,000 to 100,000 times less than annual average exposure from medical exams. Therefore, the observed positive distance trend remains unexplained. And I, I feel that I'm repeating uh, in some ways what we heard earlier this morning from Dr. Wordelec Wordelecki, that um, we're, we're not able to conclude uh, anything from the studies that have been done because they don't comport with the projections from the A-bomb survivor studies. Um, yesterday, uh, Dr. Brenner compared the radiation risks to deaths from violence and the earthquake and tsunami in Fukushima. Um, and I, I think he has a point. But I would uh, ask the question, what's the difference between these Energy generation and medical irradiation, from that matter, uh, energy generation is highly profitable. And it's a public decision made by politicians who are in many cases tied to nuclear companies and weapons contractors that created the nuclear energy industry in the first place. Um, there's been discussion of public education. And I would argue, yes, we need public ed education. Uh, not only about radiation, but about science and about civic life, because our science is affected by our political system. Um, in Fukushima, uh, in Fukushima, there will be extra challenges to epidemiologic studies when we compare the situation to the others I've mentioned today um, and that have been mentioned here earlier. Uh, and some of those challenges involve the fact that there was an earthquake and a tsunami and there were huge disruptions of, of living conditions. There was a lot of uh, relocation. People were moving around, estimating doses for individuals, which is important and critical in epidemiologic studies, will be made very much more difficult. Um, Ian Fairley showed just recently uh, time trends in infant mortality, and we could look for other time trends. And let's remember that radiation was not the only thing going on at, at, that was uh, different after this event. People were moving, they were relocating, their diets were affected, their medical services were affected. Uh, people died. Many, many thousands of people died. Uh, so this is all going on at the same time, and it's going to be difficult to separate out the radiation effects from this. Uh, one of the things I think is very important is that uh, there are risks from conducting research. And some research can be designed in such a way that it is unable to detect an effect even if the effect is there. This is something that the exposed populations need to understand because if, they're, if they come to count on science to help them, they need to know that science isn't perfect and it's never done in perfect conditions. Um, there were also comments yesterday uh, and earlier today about bias and objectivity in science. And I would like to uh, leave you with the idea that, that the main threat here is a lack of critical thinking, and that this includes self-critical thinking. Uh, and in this area that we're interested in here at this symposium, I think one primary problem is the failure to question authority. And that is a great example to me is the lifespan study, which is applied all the time, every day, from legal situations to workers' compensation to estimating health effects of, of the Fukushima events. And 
Authority is very important because authorities control access to jobs, to research funding, professional meetings and journals. Uh, Tim Musso talked about this yesterday. Uh, what we're trying to do is very difficult. It's not easy. Um, but as we proceed to get more information on the effects of Fukushima to learn more about the population impacts, one of the things that I would ask is that we not confuse narrowly constructed research hypotheses, meaning that there would be an excess of some condition in an exposed population. Let's not confuse that with the systemic analyses that we are also interested in. Things like, uh, is nuclear power a good policy? That's a different question. If nuclear power is a bad policy, it doesn't mean that every study has to find an excess cancer. That's a different question. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, maybe talk to you later.